explain anything. Uh, and so I was looking for a simple explanation, and I think uh, I've found the essence of it, and it does explain how the planetary system could have been quite chaotic some thousands of years ago, and yet achieve a stability which makes it look as though it's been uh, wound up like clockwork. Well, it's, it's a fascinating theory, and, and we're definitely going to get uh, more into it here as we as we go along. Uh, uh, maybe you can give us a brief outline of, of the, the theory of the electric universe, if we have some listeners out there uh, that uh, might not be familiar uh, with this idea yet, Walt. Well, it's pretty confronting. Uh, the first thing we say is that we do not understand the sun, and that the th- idea that it's a thermonuclear uh, uh, energy source is incorrect. And in fact, it works in much the same way as uh, scientists on Earth have tried to recreate the energy of the sun by uh, fusion experiments, where they pour a huge amount of electrical energy into this system to try and get a little bit of thermonuclear energy out. Well, stars do the same thing. They accept a huge amount of electrical energy from their environment, from the galaxy, and the result is a small amount of nuclear reactions and the creation or the generation of um, heavier elements, which we see in the solar spectrum. Uh, There was an engineer who um, was associated with Velikovsky and whom I considered to be uh, a brilliant fellow, but unknown. Uh, And he pointed out that all of the obvious features of the sun have no place being there Uh, if you uh, just use the thermonuclear theory in an effort to explain them. He said, if you look at it dispassionately, all of the features of the sun can be explained in terms of a gas discharge. And uh, from this simple basis, he was able to describe all the features we see on the sun, the granulation, the uh, spicules, the hot corona, and so on. Uh, So... uh, The first thing we have to get around is the idea that stars are not thermonuclear bombs somehow controlled and, uh, and, uh, you know, contained so that they don't explode. (laughs) Um, This also raises the issue then, okay, if the sun is powered electrically, where does it get its power from? If the galaxy is, has electric currents flowing in it, Mm. where do they flow and how are they generated? And the answer to that is that uh, the radio astronomers have been able to map these current flows by the signals they give out in the radio uh, spectrum, and they find that galaxies are strung like Catherine wheels on these huge intergalactic filaments. And so it seems that uh, electric power from beyond the galaxy actually uh, forms galaxies and stars themselves. And this raises all sorts of other questions about the Big Bang Theory and um, origins and so on. And what we can say is that we don't know enough yet to be able to even ask the right questions about origins. Uh, we, our ignorance is so profound since we've got so much wrong that uh, we have to start all over again. What we can say from observations is that the universe is of unknown age and of unknown extent. So it's not, uh, um, what is it now that they're up, up to 16 billion years or something like that? They, they throw out a, a number, but you'd, uh, you'd refute that? <clears throat> well, all, all we can say is that uh, there have been all sorts of anomalies with uh, these pronouncements, uh, like finding stars that appear to be older than the, uh, uh, the universe <laughs> <laughs> and so on. Uh, it really is presumptuous of us to think that we can talk about origins, uh, creation of the universe, um, and particularly when certain evidence is overlooked. Uh, some of that evidence shows that uh, redshift is not a measure of velocity of recession. Uh, most of it isn't anyway. That redshift is actually associated with the age of an object so that uh, these quasars, as they call them, which are supposed to be at the ends of the universe and extremely bright, are actually quite close. They're associated with nearby galaxies and they're faint because they are newly born. And there's a kind of a biological aspect uh, 
to the electric universe because the empirical evidence shows that galaxies, active galaxies, give birth to quasars which then evolve into companion galaxies. And uh, the evidence for this is, uh, well, in my opinion, it's overwhelming. But uh, when you see things through the conventional lens, you have to introduce things like dark matter and dark energy yes. and uh, the expanding universe, all of these really nonsensical ideas in order just to patch up the theory so that it appears to work. <laughs> the electric universe doesn't require any patching. It just works on what we see and it applies really just electrical engineering uh, uh, theory to the universe. And the best thing about that is that it works. Uh, would you also say that the because I remember when we had uh, Rens van der Sluis with us to talk about what he called plasma mythology. He when he talked about yes. plasma, he said that it was uh, also scalable, meaning that you can actually replicate this in in a, in a miniature version, a microcosm level of this as well, so to speak. So, uh, yeah. in a way, I guess what you're saying as well is that we can do experiments here on Earth in vacuum tubes and things like this to replicate what actually is going on on the macrocosm level. Is, is that correct? That's precisely right. Uh, Hans Elfain, the Nobel Prize winner in plasma physics, uh, pointed out that uh, plasma affects a scalable over at least 14 orders of magnitude and probably more. And that's sufficient to take you from the lab-sized uh, experiment to um, the size of galaxies and beyond. Hmm. Well, it's really fascinating. I, I do want to talk a little bit about here as well in terms of uh, some of the uh, the suppressed science, and obviously you brought up uh, Emanuel Velakovsky. You mentioned Hannes Alfven as well, this, the Swedish electrical yes. engineer who studied plasma physics. Uh, you have a great paragraph on your website that says, um, if I have an underlying purpose, it's you who's writing this, uh, in my life, it has been to watch for intellectual explorers who have been marginalized by their peers. Uh, they are often those who have the audacity to use their imagination on common sense and courage to challenge the paradigm paralysis institutionalized in Western science. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about <laughs> some of those names. I mean, uh, Hannes Alfvén, as I mentioned, okay, he, he got a uh, Nobel Peace Prize, I think, but that was in, for, for something else, not in terms of plasma physics directly. And then we have names like um, Michael Faraday, uh, Halton uh, Arp that you mentioned before our recording. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Will, William Herschel, and again, then Emanuel Velikovsky. But um, why do you think that the, these fellers' work have been so vehemently uh, suppressed uh, throughout the years? I don't know. It's an interesting topic, the sociology of science, and I have a file which you couldn't jump over uh, on that very topic. <laughs> I'm sure many books could be written about it. Uh, the thing is that we should maintain some kind of uh, common sense attitude towards scientists and realize that they are driven by the same kinds of human uh, uh, triggers as everyone else and their responses to um, uh, information can be just as irrational as ours. <laughs> hmm. and, and when you talk about the scientific method, which is often used as a blunt instrument to uh, beat everyone into submission, uh, <laughs> It's, there are as many more scientific methods as there are scientists. So there is no such thing as the scientific method. There are certain standards that you're supposed to adhere to, but often those standards uh, are, not, are not met. <clears throat> so what, what, oh, pardon what, the noise. <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, so so what, what, it's interesting that in that sense that... Um, we always get fed by this idea that there is a consensus out there. I mean, I do want to ask you later, for instance, about global warming. We can talk about that separately, uh, which mm. is another one of these things where they, they claim that um, it's, it's a consensus and all scientists agree, etc. But we never get uh, confronted with the fact that these are only theories, as you mentioned before, uh, in terms of some of the things that Einstein brought forth and so forth as well. Um, yes. Uh, why do you I think, think that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact... One of my um, beefs about scientific programs shown on television is that the reporters often state things as facts yes. when they should preface the, the statement with uh, the um, accepted theories or uh, scientists believe, but not that this is a fact. Because uh, all science is uh, provisional, uh, or it's supposed to be. 
unfortunately, there is a lot of dogma.